Not much left of it, Joe. Yeah, I tried to stop, but there wasn't a chance. The car stalled right in the middle of the track. You see how many people were in it? Only that one over there, as far as I could see. He was slumped down the front seat of the car, just like he passed out or something. Still digging your grave with a knife and fork, I see, Willard. You must be down pretty deep by now. If eating a better breakfast so that I can do a better job is digging my grave with my knife and fork, as you so quaintly observe, Mr. Keats, let me recommend something like that for you. Maybe one of those breakfast steaks of Wally's would make a real newspaper man of you. How about it, Mr. Keats? Only take a minute to cook it. Yeah, I know, Wally. And 30 seconds to eat it. No, thanks. Just give me a cup of black coffee. Only something with the body of a man, the soul of a rat, and the brain of a dinosaur would think of stuff in his belly at this early hour. Of course, don't get me wrong. I love all editors, especially fat ones. Now that I'm no longer working for him. That's right, Wally. Ah, Mr. Keats has retired from the regular staff. He now has an office of his own and reports directly to the publisher. Ah, success. What that ungrateful gargantua was trying to say, Wally, is that the former ace crime reporter of the record Herald, meaning myself, is now a feature writer. I work on my own time, I choose my own subjects. Not to mention selecting my own boss. More coffee. It's wonderful the way you scooped everybody on that Wharton case. There was more about it in this morning's paper. Remember it says here, uh, Jason Sloan, well-known leather goods manufacturer, was killed last night when his car was struck by the Upton Limited at a crossing near Chesterville. Mr. Sloan was a member of the famous Wharton trial jury and is the second one of that group to meet with an accidental death in the past month. Say, that's exactly what it says here. It should, Wally. I wrote the story myself. What's more, I've just come from the morgue. I love a morgue. Joe, I'm trying to eat my breakfast. Stop talking about the morgue. And I was about to offer him an exclusive on one of the finest feature stories ever written. It has horror, suspense, the danger of sudden death dropping mysteriously out of the night upon unsuspecting victims. Drivel. You see, Wally, I happen to know that Jason Sloan is not the second one of the Wharton jurors to have died recently. He's the fourth. What? The possibilities of this kind of story should be obvious to any real newspaper editor. Joe. Can't you see the headlines? Revenge from beyond the grave. Members of the jury quaking in fear. Cut out the ham acting. What's this about four members of the jury being dead? And a fifth one is missing. Come on, we'll talk this over in my office. Put what I owe you on my ticket, Wally. And that concludes my coffee. Now, I see the whole thing as a feature series. The jury with a dying man's curse on it. Four have died already. Who'll be next? Come on, let's get this cab. Now, there's your Wharton jury. The first to go was Baxter, the next was Winstead, then Lewis, now Sloan, with Ezra Chinning missing. Headline, who will be next? That's a good angle. The Wharton case has sold more papers than any murder trial in the past ten years. What if somebody's trying to bump off the entire Wharton jury? Now, wait a minute. The fact that four members of the jury that mistakenly convicted Harry Wharton of murder have all died accidental deaths in the past six months is good human interest. We'll sell a lot of papers. But don't make yourself ridiculous by implying that you have a private hookup with what's going to happen tomorrow. All right, it's just a thought. You know me and my hunches. Let me have the stuff as fast as you can get it out. By the way, Willard, I'll have to have a dictaphone. What's the matter with dictating to a secretary? No, Mr. Apple. You know if I'm dictating to a pretty secretary, my mind is apt to wander. And a pretty secretary taking dictation from me... I know, her mind's liable to wander. Well, if you want the stuff in a hurry... Oh. Once again, the tragic story of Harry J. Wharton finds its way to the pages of this newspaper. Harry Wharton, rich young man about town who was tried for his life for the murder of Marie Chappelle, convicted by a jury of his peers and sentenced to be hanged for a crime he did not commit. Marie Chappelle was one of those who neither toiled nor spun. She was from a different social stratum than Harry Wharton, but somehow she caught the young man's fancy. Then one night... Marie, wake up. Who's there? Who's there? Ah! But Harry Wharton was convicted of a crime he did not commit. Mr. George Saswell. The DA is using George Sasbo as a surprise witness to place you at the scene of the crime. Do you know anything about him? I don't think I ever saw him before. Mr. Sasbo, am I to understand you actually heard the fatal shots? Yes, sir. I was outside the apartment house when I heard the shots. Miss Marie Chappelle, the deceased, had hired me to tail Mr. Wharton, follow him. 
That's my business. I'm a private detective. Mr. Sasbo, why did Miss Chappelle ask to have Mr. Wharton followed? Marie, uh, Miss Chappelle was afraid uh, he'd run out on her and not go through with his promise of marriage. I object. <laughs> Mr. Wharton, did you or did you not fire the shots that took Marie Chappelle's life? I did not. Was there any reason for you to desire the death of the girl? None whatsoever. Now tell us in your own words, Mr. Wharton, exactly what happened and where on the evening the crime was committed. I was having dinner at the athletic club and... What time was that? Well, I'd say it was about 8.15 or quarter of nine. You know, I'd like to see that poor guy get a break. And that's on the level. Not a chance. They got enough on Wharton to hang him twice. Yeah, maybe so. But there's something too pat about this case. Yeah. Uh oh, here they come. the jury. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you agreed upon the verdict? We have, Your Honor. The clerk will read the verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty as charged. Defense request that the jury be polled, Your Honor. The clerk will poll the jurors. Jerome K. Bentley, is this your verdict? Yes. Peter Jackson, is this your verdict? Yes. But I am innocent. I am innocent. Emily Stagler, is this your verdict? Yes. Charles Winston, is this your verdict? Yes. Avery Nordic, is this your verdict? Yes. Alice Hill, is this your verdict? Yes. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Those words seem to burn their way into Wharton's mind. Hello. Hello, Cherry Blossom. Just in time for the first installment. Type those up like a good girl, will you, and tell old Falstaff I'm going right ahead. It takes a long time to hang a man in this great state of ours. The sovereign people are careful. They don't want to make any mistakes. Friends of Wharton rallied to his aid. There were motions and appeals and interviews with the governor, all to no avail. Harry Wharton had been found guilty by a jury of his peers. Twelve tried and true men and women sitting in legal judgment. And the law must take its course. I was the only one who continued to believe in Harry Wharton's innocence. With nothing stronger than my own personal hunch, I kept up the uneven fight. Then, on the night before Harry Wharton was to hang, I made my way toward Wally's Grotto. Hello, Mr. Keats. Hello there, Mr. Sasbo. Make mine coffee. I've been looking for you. I thought I might do an interview on you. You know, something about the feelings of the guy whose testimony put the rope around the other man's neck the night before the other fellow hangs. I don't give out interviews. 
I don't know what your game is, Keats, but let me give you a little advice. Snooping around where you're not wanted is liable to earn you a hole in the head. Here you are, Wally. Joint's getting crowded. Sounds kind of touchy. Well, who shot you? The dirty double-crosser. This is the way he pays me off. I knew too much, see? But bullets are cheaper than... How bad am I? I can't tell, George. How do you feel? I don't feel nothing. I'm numb. I'm afraid that's pretty bad then, George. You got something you want to get off your chest? Yeah. About Horton? Yeah. He was framed. F framed by a guy named Gordon Cook. Framed by Gordon Cook. Marie Chappelle was his gal, the rat. He was supposed to give me the rest of my dote tonight. Hey, I'll need some witnesses to this confession. Listen. Then followed a race against time. Only a few hours stood between Harry Wharton and eternity. There were lawyers to see, depositions to be made, last-minute appeals to the governor. The wheels of justice were made to turn backward. Then, as the cold gray light of dawn crept into Harry Wharton's death cell, the warden broke the news of his pardon. Don't you understand, Harry? You're a free man. Mr. Keats here discovered new evidence in your case, and the governor acted immediately. I'm not going to hang. I'm not going to hang. Why, I've been hanged a hundred times already. I'm a dead man. One of the living dead. Every time somebody marched down those stairs, I marched with him. I've hanged so many men on the gallows, the rope no longer chokes me. <laughs> That's funny, isn't it? Let's go down to my office, Harry. Just a minute, Wharton. Did you know that everything in these cells is done by twelves? There are twelve bars from the ceiling to the floor. It's exactly twelve steps around the inside of this. The guard takes just twelve steps from the stairs to here. Everything, everywhere, in twelves. <laughs> like a jury. Twelve. 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 Come on. <laughs> the story of Harry Wharton, gentle reader, deserves a happy ending. But such was not to be. The man's mind had crumbled away during those dark months in the death house. When he was freed, he went directly to a private hospital for treatment. For a while, his condition seemed to improve. He received visitors, some of them members of the jury who had convicted him, anxious to make amends for the suffering they'd caused him. You have a visitor downstairs, Mr. Horton. Would you like to see him? Certainly. I'll send him right up. Oh, I'm going off duty now. If you need anything, just ring for the floor nurse. Thank you, nurse. I have everything I need. A few hours later, a nurse heard strange crackling noises coming from Harry Wharton's room. Ah! Help! Oh, hey. Hospital attendants rushed to smash their way into the room, but to no avail. Weary of living within the sort of mental twilight which was his existence, Harry Wharton had taken 12 feet of clothesline from the hospital laundry, set fire to his room and hanged himself. When the flames were extinguished, it was discovered that Harry Wharton's body had been burned beyond recognition.
Harry Wharton died for the last time. This time of his own choice and by his own hand. Good morning, Willard. Morning. Just read the first stuff. Sounds pretty good. Pretty good. The trouble with you, Mr. Apple, can be summed up in one word. Worms. Worms? Yes, worms. You're full of holes. You're eaten with jealousy. Look, Joe, I don't want you to give me a rehash on the Wharton case. I want reader interest. The ghost of Harry Wharton stalking the 12 people who convicted him. Say, whose idea is this? I'm going to personally interview each and every one of those jurors. I'll get statements and pictures and life stories and incidentally scare the pants off of them. That's the stuff. Now you're talking like... Like your favorite reporter, I know. And before I get through, I hope you get sued for violating somebody's privacy. Say, how's that for a publicity angle? Let me worry about the exploitation. You just get the stories. Would you like my coffee? I don't mean to seem rude, but... Your attempts to capitalize on a series of coincidences to sensationalize them are both, well, cheap and revolting. Just tell me what your first reaction was when you read in the Record Herald that five of your fellow jurors had been accidentally killed. Mr. Keats, you compel me to repeat that I did not read in the Record Herald where five of my fellow jurors were dead. I don't read the Record Herald. I told you that yesterday and I told you that the day before. All right, Miss Hill, but what if there is something back of all these coincidental deaths? Rubbish. You say that now, but what if tonight or... Tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, another juror dies strangely and suddenly. What would you say then? I'd say good afternoon, Mr. Keats. Now, if you don't mind, I have an appointment. By the way, do you have a new photograph of yourself? The ones taken when you're on the jury are terrible. I warned you I wouldn't be a party to any of your cheap publicity stunts. No picture, no interview, no story. You make a newspaper man's life very difficult, Miss Hill. I'm sorry. A picture of you would look nice, too. Sort of dressed up the page. Couldn't you spare even a little snapshot? So big. Goodbye. Goodbye. You mustn't mind her. She's really been terribly upset about the whole thing. Tell her to forget it. She's a pretty girl. She'll wrinkle. I tell her that all the time. But she's so serious. Says her conscience has never given her a minute's peace since that poor Mr. Walton hung himself. She'll have to relax. Oh, Mr. Keats, here's something for your personal files. Hey, thanks. Oh, Tex, did you call about that ship in a glass? Why, yes, Alice. Well, goodbye again. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, goodbye. Nothing quite as fresh as a fresh newspaperman. Oh, I've got to run. I have a date for tea. Who with? Jerome K. Bentley. Who? He was foreman of the Wharton jury. He wants to talk to me about furnishing an old house he bought up near Buckminster. Called this morning. <laughs> Haven't seen or heard of him since the trial. Well, I'll see you later, Tex. So long, honey. I remember from our jury acquaintance that you were a dealer in antiques. When I bought my old house, I thought of you at once. That's very nice of you, Mr. Bentley. I'm sure we'll have some things for it you'll like. I'm anxious to see your house. You shall see it, Miss Hill. I promise you. Very soon. Shall we go? Yes. One moment, sir. You forgot your gloves. Thank you. Don't read over my shoulder. It makes me nervous. Sorry, I was just trying to avoid looking at your face. What's the matter, hangover? I haven't had a drink for four days. You must be in love. 
Look, I've been thinking, maybe we ought to wind up the articles on the Porton case. Are you crazy? This is the best feature we've had since the trial. It's just cheap sensationalism. Who are we trying to fool? I've interviewed all but two of those people who are on the jury. They're nice folks, minding their business, doing their job. What civilian sob sister has been talking to you? Snap out of it, Joe. This is the newspaper business. Or am I correct in suspecting that you've been seeing too much of a certain lady juror? Look, let's cut the kidding about Alice. I'm serious. Okay, but do me a favor, will you? Go on down to Wally's and eat a good breakfast. It'll cheer you up. Why don't you concentrate on your own waistline and leave mine alone? Hello, Marcy. Hello. He's a way off its feed. No, oh, it's terrible, the things a woman can do to a man. The mayor's been calling you, Mr. Apple. I promised him you'd call him right back. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wally, you're an authority on women. Tell me something. I don't know a thing about them. I don't even let them in the place. That, my friend, proves you're an authority. I want to ask your advice on a purely hypothetical case. A friend of mine. This friend of mine got interested in a girl. He never intended to get interested in her. He met her in line of duty and sort of fell for her. Pardon me. Hello? Oh, hello, Mr. Apple. Yes, yes, he's here. It's your boss, Joe. Tell him I'm seeing a man about a steam shovel. It's funny he seems to have stepped out for a second, Mr. Apple. Yes. Yes, okay, I'll tell him. You bet. Joe, he's pretty excited. He said another juror on the Wharton case had been killed. This time, a woman. A woman? Was it Alice Hill? He didn't say. Just said for you to get over to the morgue as fast as you can. The morgue? Hello, Joe. Hello, Inspector. All right, Mike. Name of deceased, Mrs. Emil Stagler. Occupation, housewife. Cause of death, strangulation. Where'd they find her, Inspector? Out on Highway 9. Whoever strangled her drove her there in her own car. Then he ran the car over an embankment and tried to set fire to it. Couldn't burn much because the gas tank was nearly empty. And you're the guy who's been writing those articles about Harry Wharton and that stuff about vengeance from beyond the grave. That's right. How does this make you feel? You mean, do I feel like I've been peering into a crystal ball? Foretelling the future and all that? No. I mean, how does it feel being responsible for a nice, fresh crime wave? Everything was going along nice and quiet till you decided to revive the Wharton case. Then some harmless crank turns homicidal maniac because he thinks he ought to avenge a miscarriage of justice. Take it easy, Inspector. Don't try to pin this on me. There were several members of the Wharton jury who died before I even started writing the articles. Remember? Those were just coincidences. They died accidentally. But that red ring around the lady's neck, that didn't come from wearing a necklace. That's a rope burn. This woman was hung before she was ever driven off the road. Okay, Mike, put her away. But it's ridiculous to think that a newspaper story would inspire someone to go out and start to kill an entire jury without any reason. What's so ridiculous about it? This is a big town. There are a lot of cranks in it. Suggest something like this to a nut and right away he runs amok. He wants to become an avenger. You mean there's no other possible motive for this killing? Mrs. Stagler didn't have an enemy in the world. Excuse me, boys. I gotta make a call. Read all about it. Read all about it. Get your evening paper here. Killer eludes police. Thank you. Get your evening paper here. Killer eludes police. Here you are, sir. Thank you. Killer eludes police. Get your evening paper here. Night final. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Paper, mister. Thank you, sir. Get your evening paper here. Read all about it. Read all about it. Get your evening paper here. Killer eludes police. Uh, just a moment, please. Are you Jerome K. Bentley? Yes. I'm Garrett, uh, homicide detail. Inspector David sent me over here to kind of keep an eye on things. Sort of a bodyguard until the excitement quiets down. Hope you don't mind. Not at all, officer. In fact, it's quite reassuring. Oh, boy, but I'm tired. What got into you, Mr. Jerome K. Bentley, that he suddenly decided he want all this stuff shipped tomorrow? He wants to move to the country as soon as his house is ready. You should be glad, Texas. The biggest order we've had in months. Oh, I'll be glad when I've slept about 12 hours. Right now I'm too tired. Okay, honey. One thing about Mr. Bentley that struck me as rather odd was that he kept asking if we had 12 of everything. I 
wonder what he wanted 12 of everything for. Quarter past 12. Look, take it easy. You're making me nervous. I'm making you nervous. How do you suppose it makes me feel to see you standing there munching your gum while some homicidal maniac is probably strangling my girl? Your girl? She doesn't know it yet, but she is. Well, can't you do something? About making her your girl? No, about finding her. I was told to watch the house, and I'm watching it. You've been watching it for four hours. She isn't here. Nobody knows where she is. I could hazard a guess. Yeah, where? Coming across the street. Girls, don't do this, Uncle Joe. I worry. Well, look who's been standing on our doorstep. Our favorite newspaper man. We worked until midnight and decided to walk home. Who decided? Haven't you heard what's happened? No, we didn't even leave the shop to eat. That policeman standing on your doorstep is there because an insane killer is trying to murder every man and woman who served on the Wharton jury. He may have chosen you as his next victim. Oh, I thought you were going to quit trying to scare people. Here's our runaway, Regan. I'm Sergeant Regan, ma'am. We've been instructed to keep an eye on your apartment until the killer is apprehended. The killer? Mrs. Stagler, who was on the jury with you, has been murdered. Mrs. Stagler? Say, all the way home I had the feeling we were being followed. <laughs> Are you talking silly, Tex? Let's go to make a cup of coffee. Would you like a cup, Sergeant? You bet. <laughs> I must have misplaced my key. Do you have yours? Why, well, clutched in my lily white hand, sugar. Stand aside. Was I presumptuous to have let myself in? You know this man? Yes, this is Mr. Bentley. He's a customer of mine. I'm sorry, Miss Hill. I saw him enter the apartment, but I thought he was. That's going all to... right, officer. I've known Mr. Bentley for some time. I found Miss Hill's key in my own pocket, of all places, and dropped in to return it. I must have picked it up off your desk this morning, <laughs> by mistake. Thank you so much. I'm glad to have it back. I'm always losing it. I also brought these, in case my unexpected visit should have displeased you. Oh, not at all. Thank you. You know Miss Tuttle. And this is Mr. Keats and Officer Regan. You remember Mr. Bentley? He was foreman of our jury. Mr. Bentley, I've been wanting to get in touch with you. Well, that's quite a coincidence. Because I've been thinking of getting in touch with you, Mr. Keats. It's fate, that's what it is. Alice, you brought Joe and Mr. Bentley together. Now I'll go bring some coffee and water together and see what comes of that. Want to help, Sergeant? Sure thing. Tex, would you put these in water, please? Sit down, won't you? It was Joe who dug up all the evidence that saved Harry Wharton. Yes, I know. I've been reading Mr. Keats' recent articles with considerable interest. In fact, uh, I've been wondering why the police haven't uh, arranged some sort of protection for him. What for? It merely occurred to me the mysterious killer might decide to hold you responsible for making his task more difficult. No, that's where you're wrong. The man's obviously a maniac with one fixed idea. He wants to do away with the jury because they mistakenly convicted the wrong man. He's bound to know that it was I who saved Harry Wharton from the gallows. Yes so he could hang himself in an insane asylum a little later. I really must go, Miss Hill. Uh, you won't forget to ship my things tomorrow, will you? Well, they're all packed and ready. Won't you stand and have some coffee with us? No, thanks. Will you say goodbye to the others for me? Of course. I'm sorry you have to hurry. Good night. Good night. Don't forget about the talk we're going to have. I'm looking forward to it, Mr. Keats. I'm looking forward to it. If you were to ask me, I'd say the guy had his nerve walking into your house and making himself at home like that. Oh, I don't mind. He's nice and a very good customer. Besides, he was doing me a favor. Yeah. He didn't seem a bit scared either, wandering around alone at night. He was foreman of the jury, you know. Yes, I know. Rather quiet, but very nice. Oh? All right, break it up. This coffee's so strong now, it ought to be carrying me instead of vice versa. Well, what happened to our little brawler? Oh, he has to be excused. Want to know a secret? I think Mr. Benton is kind of sweet on a certain young lady. Oh, Tex, you're talking nonsense. Well, he certainly scooted out of here fast enough when two other men showed up. That confirms my good taste in women. 
prove I have no hard feelings, I propose a toast to Mr. Bentley. May the killer never discover that he likes to prowl by night and deliver posies to pretty ladies. Good night, Reagan. Keep a sharp eye on my chickens. I will, Joe. That girl from Texas makes good coffee. See that it keeps you awake. Good night. Good night. Why don't you run on along home? You're making me nervous. Hello again, Mr. Keats. Oh, hello, Mr. Bentley. May I join you? I think we're going the same way. Certainly, but I thought you were probably home in bed by now. I have a confession to make, Mr. Keats. I've been waiting for you. That's funny. Back there, I had the feeling I was being followed. Now you tell me you were waiting for me all the time. I guess that makes me psychic. Everyone is psychic to a more or less degree, Mr. Keats. Well, I don't carry a spare crystal ball around with me, but I do play hunches. When you're always on the lookout for news, you develop a sort of a sixth sense. Perhaps I've developed a sixth sense, too. Because I have a hunch, as you call it, that the identity of the unknown killer will be revealed today. What makes you think so? Because I know who the murderer is. Are you sure? Reasonably so. Well, if you have any information, you shouldn't be withholding it from the police, you know. That makes you an accessory. For a newspaper man, you are most naive. I said I had a hunch. If you wish to accompany me and see if my hunch is correct, I think you may run across a most unusual story. At least I can promise you a most interesting experience. I don't see how I can pass up a chance like this. Where do we go? When do we start? We start now. Taxi! Police headquarters. Police headquarters? night at this time. I like to watch the police line up. Do you expect to find our mutual friend here? Keep the change. If one attends the police lineup often enough, one is apt to meet almost anyone. Do you know what interests me most, Mr. Keats? No, Mr. Bentley. This is getting to sound a little like an old-time minstrel show. What interests you most? As I watch the men in the lineup, I wonder how many evil ones are turned loose and how many innocent ones are found guilty. That's enough to keep almost anyone awake all night. Albert Leonard, alias Albert Lichter, alias Alfred Link, age 37, height 5 feet 8 and 1 quarter, weight 151 pounds, previous arrests 12, convictions 2, grand theft auto, larceny. William Black, alias night George after Blake, night, alias Charles Blackwell, never ending hunt goes on, age 43, searching for the proverbial needle in the haystack, sifting each human straw to find the one that looks guilty. What started you on this night prowling, Mr. Bentley? Oh, I have no family. No uh, business affairs that require my attention in the daytime. Have you always had these nocturnal habits, or did you acquire them after Harry Wharton was convicted? After. Truth is, I haven't slept since Mr. Wharton was convicted. I spend my nights exploring the jungles of this great city. I find it fascinating. The battle of good versus evil. I could take you places, show you things that would surprise even a man of your wide acquaintance. Maybe later. Don't forget our date to meet the killer. At dawn, my dear friend. Let's That's several hours away. Let me make a telephone call first. A hey, telephone call? I yes, I always keep in touch with the paper. They like to know if I'm on the job. I'll only be a minute. Convictions one.
Give me the desk. Who's this? Mac, listen. Yeah, yeah, I heard what you said. Jerome K. Bentley is crazy in the head, and he's gonna introduce you to the killer at daybreak. Well, I don't know who's the crazy, or him for telling you, or you for believing him. Don't be funny. I've got a hunch that Jerome K. Bentley may be the killer. Well, good luck. Yeah, I thought that'd make you sit up and take notice. This is what I want you to do. Be nice if you can crack this story, but don't stick your neck into anything tighter than a horse collar. You check in every hour so we know you're okay. And look, kid, if anything happens to you, we'll bury you with honors in Potter's Field. Yeah. <laughs> I never saw a man who looked with such a wistful eye upon that little tent of blue which prisoners call the sky and at every drifting cloud that went with sails of silver by. Where'd you learn that, Cully? Mr. Bentley, he taught it to me. He likes to have me recite while I'm massaging his neck. It's Oscar Wilde's Battle of Reading Jail. Go on, Cully. Some kill their love when they are young and some when they are old. I don't remember that verse, Mr. Bentley. I like the one. He does not die a death of shame on a day of dark disgrace, nor have a noose about his neck, nor a cloth upon his face, nor drop feet foremost through the floor into an empty space. This is quite a way to round out an evening of revelry. You mean to tell me you come here every night to have your neck massaged? That's right. One hour with Cully fixes me up for another 24 hours. How's it feel now, Mr. Bentley? Your hands work miracles, Cully. These hands can fix anything. It's a gift my mother gave me, rubbing pain away. It's not the usual sort of pain, Mr. Keats. It starts as a small, dull ache in the back of the neck, sometime after midnight. In an hour, the pain is so intense, it's unbearable. Then I come to Cully. He rubs the ache away. Haven't you seen a doctor about it? That'll be enough, Cully. Thanks. Why should I see a doctor? There's nothing a doctor can do. I know what causes it. It's what's known to the medical profession as sympathism, or sympathy pains. I've had these attacks ever since the night Harry Wharton was to be hanged. They've grown more and more violent. Steam is on, gentlemen. Thank you, Cully. Can you make it extra hot tonight? Sure. Hey, this gets down to par boiling you in a hurry. Just tell me if you find the heat oppressive, Mr. Keats. When my skin begins to peel off, I'll yell. thinking about that case. Bentley? Bentley? Bentley?
in there for me, Cully. How about running down to the corner and bring us back a pot of coffee? Sure, it's daybreak. Time for coffee. Thank you, Cully. Just be a minute, Mr. Bentley. Uh, take your time, Cully. Smells like steam escaping. Door stuck. I'll cut the steam valve. Better call an ambulance. He's alive. Steam rises. He was lying on the floor next to the door. He probably got some air that way. He'll be all right. Don't you think a doctor ought to look at him? Of course, Cully. I'll call the emergency hospital. Operator, give me the emergency hospital, please. I wish to report an accident. How is he, Doc? I'll tell him, Doctor. Never mind. If he can talk, he's all right. I rushed right over just as soon as I got the news. Didn't even stop to have breakfast. Now, my little steam clam, what's this all about? What have you been up to? He must really believe I have a story if he missed eating to come over here. Excuse me. Going, Doctor? I'll drop back a little later. Now, I want you to rest, Joe. Take it easy for a few days. Don't feel badly about missing out on the story you were telling Mac about. Why, if this accident hadn't happened, you'd have scooped the town. Wait a minute. Maybe you know what you're talking about, but I don't. What happened to me last night was no accident. I was deliberately locked in that steam room by the same man who's trying to kill off the Wharton jury. Sure, Joe. Mac told me about your tip from Bentley. Evidently, Mr. Bentley knew what he was talking about when he said he'd introduce you to the killer. Look, I've been sopping up liquid like a bar towel, but I'm beginning to believe you're wetter than I am. I'm trying to tell you Jerome K. Bentley is the killer. You'll have a little trouble making that charge stick. I've got the guy dead to rights. Oh, no, you haven't. What do you mean, I haven't? Because the real killer has already confessed. What? The murderer walked into police headquarters this morning and gave himself up. The police are questioning him now. And it's not Bentley? No. This guy seems to know all about the killings, stuff that he couldn't possibly have picked up from the paper. He's the one all right, Joe. Not Bentley. Look, Willard, you know I play my hunches. I don't know anything about this guy who's confessed, but, well, there's something phony about it. But, Joe, he knows every angle, every detail. He's got to be the killer. No one but the killer could possibly have all the information he has. Don't fall for that confession. I've got to get out of here. You've got to take care of yourself. But you don't understand. As soon as those people on the jury hear the killer's confess, they'll come out of hiding. They won't have any more protection. Behave yourself. Do you want to be strapped to your bed? Somebody's got to warn them. That's more like it. Now you're my favorite newspaper man again. Yeah. I guess I got a little excited. Will you go to sleep? If I leave you alone for a while? Sure. I'm half asleep already. That's the stuff. A little rest, and you'll be on your feet in no time. I'll see you later. please. Sorry, Sergeant. I'm Joe Keats, Record Herald. I want to see Inspector Davis. It's important. I'm sorry. The inspector's busy, Mr. Keats. What's it about? I've got some information on the Wharton case. Important information. Hello, Jimmy. Let me speak to Inspector Davis, please. Inspector? Sergeant Luton. Joe Keats is here. Says he has some information on the Wharton case. All right, tell him I'll come out. Have him repeat that list of jurors he killed. I'll be back in a minute.
Tell us once more, Mr. Pearson, in exactly what order you killed the seven jurors. This guy Pearson doesn't talk like any crank. He's giving us chapter and verse on every one of the killings. I know I sound crazy, Inspector. I'm playing another hunch. There's something screwy about this whole setup. I can't ignore the evidence of a man who insists he's the killer and then proves it. The boys are in there now trying to break him down, but his story is solid. Meanwhile, innocent people think they're safe again and start going about their business. I'd like to have a look at this self-confessed killer. Come on in. The last time you spoke of Mr. Sloan, you called him Joseph. His real name happens to be Jason. What difference does that make, Joseph or Jason? He's just as dead, whichever name he had. I tell you again, I killed them. All seven of them. And I was going to kill the rest. Let me ask him a question, Inspector. You've named the seven you killed, Mr. Pearson, in the order in which you killed them. Now tell me the names of the other five jurors in the order in which you intended to kill them. The other five? That's quite irrelevant. I intended to kill them. That's the important thing. Who is this? This is Mr. Keats. A lawyer. I want no lawyer. I'll defend myself. He's not a lawyer. He's a newspaper man. Joe Keats. Oh. Joe Keats. I almost feel like I know you, Mr. Keats. I think I've read every word you've written on the Wharton case. It was all very interesting, too. Sometimes your guesses were right, sometimes wrong. But then I'm the only one who knows all about the killings. Did you read what the other reporters wrote? Oh, yes, every word. But I liked your articles best. They were much more vivid. I see. I know why you're here. You want a feature article, don't you? And you will get it. You will get it just before they hang me. I'll make it exclusive to you, Mr. Keats. I'm more interested in people's innocence than in their guilt. You don't believe I killed them, do you? What more proof do you want? All right. Turn me loose. See what happens to the rest of them. All right, take over. All right, Mr. Pearson. Now, let's go over it again. Inspector, that guy's mad as a mad hatter. You see how he stalled when I asked him to name the other five jurors? He's a phony, a crank. Maybe you're right, Joe. I'll admit that he couldn't name the other jurors and he didn't recognize you, but I can't take the risk of letting this man go. If he's a crank, the boys will break him down sooner or later. Meanwhile, the real killer can take his time to choose another victim. Joe, sure, be reasonable. It'd cost me my job if I let that nut in there go. He knows a lot of the details, and it's a 50-50 chance he's the man we want. And don't forget the other killer, assuming that there is another killer, is just as crazy as this guy. What does that prove? That proves that I can't let this man go when he claims to be the killer just because he's crazy. Now, can I? No, I suppose not. Do me a favor, though, Inspector. Don't give out the story that you have a confession just yet. If the press gets hold of this, all the other jurors are going to think the danger is over. I'll do what I can, but as a newspaper man, you ought to know how hard it is to keep anything from the gentlemen of the press. They have a way of digging up the real facts. I'll be seeing you. Peter Jackson, Jurman 
number eight. <laughs> I'd like to speak to Mr. Peter Jackson, please. This is Mrs. Jackson. Mr. Jackson isn't here. Who did you say this was? Joe Keats of the Record Herald. I don't want to cause you any alarm, Mrs. Jackson, but there's a possibility the man who's confessed the killings is a crank. The real murderer may still be at large. Is there any place your husband can be reached? All I know, Mr. Keats, is that he went to a house near the village of Buckminster. Oh. Thank you, Mrs. Jackson. Mr. Apple's secretary. Joe Keats, where are you? Mr. Apple's been trying to find you everywhere. Never mind about that. Where's the boss? Well, you got to find him, Marcy, quick. This is something terribly important. Yeah, that's a good girl. Have him call me back here. I'm at Buckminster 2-8. It's the jail. No, I'm not under arrest. I'll explain later. You newspaper fellow said quite a story about who gets a murder story on the street first, don't you? Yeah, we do. Thought you wanted to tell him about finding that body. Well, that's my boss's secretary. I want to give this story to my editor direct. Did you find it, boys? No. You didn't find Peter Jackson's body? No. We didn't find Jackson's or any other dead body hanging there. But I saw it hanging from a beam. Well, maybe it climbed down after you left. Locked all the doors and uh, went for a swim down the river. We got a bad taste for practical jokes up here, Mr. Newspaper Man. Look, I didn't just dream up a body hanging there. I came up here because I was afraid something had happened to Peter Jackson. He was one of the Wharton jurors. Hello? Yeah, he's here. Is that for me? What'd you say your name was? Oh, come on, let me talk to him. I'll do the talking temporarily. Yeah, he came in here a half hour ago. Said he found a body hanging in an old house on the outskirts of town. When we went there to investigate, there wasn't a sign of a dead body. Oh, I see. I see. Sure, sure. I will. Till you get here. Okay. Lock him up, Ben. Lock me up? Wait a minute. You can't lock me up. What's the charge? Get in there. I demand to talk to my editor. I forgot to tell you. That was your editor I was talking to. A fella named Apple. That's a funny name. Apple. <laughs> I bet he's a peach. <laughs> This came for you at the shop. I was pretty sure it wasn't business, so I brought it over. That's very thoughtful of you, Tex. Maybe from... It's from Joe. I knew my hunches were hitting on all cylinders. What does our wandering boy have to say for himself? He wants me to meet him in Glenlock and to come alone. Is that all? That's all, except that he says it's very important. Glenlock? Well, I've been through there. That's a whistle stop to end all whistle stops. See, what are you doing? I'm going to Glenlock. But it'll be dark by the time you get there. Maybe i better go along. I'll be all right. Joe says to come alone, he must have a reason. Just keep your fingers crossed and don't tell anyone where I've gone. They're crossed, baby, and they'll stay that way till you get back. Hello? Yes, Mr. Apple? 
Tell her I found Joe. He's up in a little town called Buckminster. They're holding him at the jail. Hey, say that again, Buckminster. That's not what his telegram says. Glenlock? Oh, there must be some mistake. Say, I don't like the looks of it. You wait there, I'll be right over. Hello. Speaking. If that's my editor, I demand to talk to him. Keep your shirt on, newspaper man. It ain't your editor. Go ahead. Wait a minute. Where'd you say this was? Hold the phone. What's happened? Oh, Clem. Clem Paulskin. Come here, quick. What'd you say that fellow's name was? That fellow you said you saw hanging in the Lacey house? Peter Jackson. Why? We'll be right over. What's the excitement? Some kids just found a man's body down at the river. The man's name is Peter Jackson. He had business cards saying he was in the real estate business. Maybe there was somebody hanging in the lazy house like he said. This is a job for the sheriff. Well, I'm glad you two finally got wise to yourselves. Now, how about letting me out of here? Well, put me through to the sheriff, will you? Make it snappy on that telephone, will you? I got some important calls to make myself. <laughs> Yes, Joe. He's on his way up there now. He left here to pick up Tex. They're driving up to get you. Now give me a rewrite. Rewrite? Joe Keats, take this. Today, another member of the Wharton jury met his death. While Metropolitan Police concentrated upon a crank who professed to be the murderer, the real killer struck again. flash on the Wharton jury case. Police have broadcast a warning to be on the lookout for Jerome K. Bentley, foreman of the jury which convicted Harry Wharton. He's believed still to be in the vicinity of New York. It is believed that Bentley is responsible for... Someone meeting you, ma'am? Yes, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Startled, Miss Hill. I'm really Harry Wharton. I'm not a ghost. Or did you like me better as Jerome K. Bentley? Then Joe was right. No, Miss Hill, I'm dead. Legally. I hanged myself in the sanitarium, remember? It's Jerome K. Bentley the police are looking for. <laughs> Have you forgotten? I promised to show you my new house. The drawing room especially will interest you. It has a beam ceiling. You know. You hang things from beams. There's no answer at the Glenlock Depot, those are little out-of-the-way places. The station is only open part-time. There won't be anybody there until tomorrow morning. If anything happens to that girl. Long distance. I want to put a call through to Buckminster. I don't know the number. 
but it's the town jail. Yes? Oh, it's you. Marcy told me about Jackson. Yes. The story will be on the street in a few minutes. I know I'm a... Yes, yes. Anything you want to call me. But, Joe, what I telephoned you about is Alice. She received a wire to meet you at a little place called Glenlock. Joe didn't send that telegram. Right, we'll be there as fast as a motor escort can bring us. Come on. Now you know why I ordered everything in 12s. Call it what you will. Obsession, insanity, murder complex. Do you believe that by destroying others you can bring ease to your own mind? I must try. I can't go on this living death. I must find myself. Over the bodies of your innocent victims. Innocent? Was it innocent to send me to the death house? Have you any conception what it's like inside those cold walls? Waiting, eternally waiting to fall asleep and wake a night after night with that choking sensation in your throat. You and the others die only once. I died a hundred times, a thousand times. I must find myself. Can you find yourself through murder, through cruelty? I remember they said at your trial that... That I was the gentlest of men. I am. But only when the twelve are hanged can I return to the land of the living, to the beautiful things I love. Stand up, Alice. It's no use screaming. No one will hear you. shooting. Any one of them three bullets would have killed him. She's all right. They're lucky we're here in time. Where's Bentley? Not Bentley, Willard. If you turn him over, you'll find that's Harry Wharton. Wharton, now wait a minute. This is another one of your hunches. Careful check of the sanitarium records show Jerome K. Bentley visited Harry Wharton on the day of the latter's supposed suicide. It was Bentley's body that was found hanging in the hospital room, not Wharton's. What do you know about that? It was a miracle, Wally, absolutely a miracle. Another second, and it would have been too late. You know, you're the first woman Wally's ever allowed down here. Am I? I'm flattered. Yeah, you know, I used to have to dance down here by myself. Hungry? Couldn't eat a bite. Anyway, three's an awful crowd. Well, Mr. Apple, you think Joe will stay with the Record Herald? No, I don't know. I guess so. Unless he's thinking of going in the antique business. Hey, Joe. Come on, you two. Your dinners are getting cold. Now, where'd they disappear to? I think he took that other job. Uh, love's a stuff twill not endure, but food, food goes on forever. Now, give me a little more steak sauce, will you? And some mustard and some horseradish and some pickles. Mm -hmm. 